Okay, welcome to virtual uh, algebra class. Today we're going to be talking about utilizing the GED formula sheet again. And some of you might be thinking, why are we talking about this again, Kate? We already talked about this. Well, last time um, that we did this a couple weeks ago, and um, we do have that video up and posted. You can check it out if you wanted to. But last time we looked at some simpler examples of utilizing the GED formula sheet. One and two step um, equations. And now that we've got the skills under our belt that we learned earlier this week of solving multi-step equations, I want to look at some of the nastiest examples that might come up on the GED formula sheet that you'll have to um, be able to use all your best algebra skills for. So all I'm going to do today is look at a bunch of GED style examples. Um, there's no new information, really. We're just putting together a lot of things that we've already learned in our old lessons, and we're looking at them in trickier, um, more challenging contexts. But the GED really holds nothing back with this subject. They like tricky problems. So let's see what we can do. Okay, the first one I'd like to do, GED example number one, and I'm going to build, get a little more and more challenging. So a triangle with an area of 34, and then we see this little M2. You read that as 34 square meters. 34 square meters has a base of 15 meters. What is the height of the triangle to the nearest tenth of an inch. Okay, so let's take a look at this problem. Whenever you're faced with a new word problem, I always suggest that you look at where you're going and where you're starting from. So the, where you're going, what I mean by that is the question, what are they asking me to find here? So Merle, when you take a look at this problem, can you see what they're asking me to find or look for? The height? Of the Absolutely. Uh, the place I'm going to is the height. I need to find the height of this triangle. And then we have been given some information. We don't just have this height, we know where we're starting from. And we have some starting information they gave us area and they gave us the base of this triangle. So let's take a look. Anytime I see area, perimeter, volume, um, or surface area, I know that those geometry concepts are on my GED formula sheet. So I'm going to take a look at my GED formula sheet. And what formula do I want? Well, um, I know that we're going to find height, but no matter how hard you search on this formula sheet, you will not find a formula for height. Height is just a dimension, um, and it's inside of many of the formulas, but what we're actually going to have to use is we're going to have to use our area formula. <clears throat> and if you look at our area of a triangle formula, so Merle, can you find that area of a triangle formula? Um, two, oh. It says... Yeah, right in that first... Part says area, and then can you see where the triangle one is? Yes, it's A plus one and a half BH. Oh, I think your eyes flicked down to the trapezoid. Look up one more to the triangle, and we say A equals. Oh, yeah, you just read it as plus instead of equals. There you go. Mm -hmm. A equals Sorry. one, you're fine, one half BH. Is that the one you saw, Merle? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so when it says A equals, it's saying to find area, multiply half of base times height. But I'm not trying to find area, I'm trying to find height. But because this thing has the relationship between area and height, I can use it to find any missing variable. It doesn't matter if it's area, base, or height. I could use this formula for any of those. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug into this formula what we know. So let's take a look. The first thing we know is the area is 34. And so underneath the letter A, I'm going to write 34. Are you cool with that? Mm -hmm. And I can also see that the base, the B, is 15. So underneath the base, the B, I'm going to write 15. Okay. Now, 
uh, let's go ahead and plug in the rest of the stuff. We're going to have our equal sign drop. We'll have our half drop. Now think about what's happening between this half and this B. If they're shoved together here like this, do you know what operation that is? Uh, multiply. Exactly. And I'm going to use parentheses to say multiply because I don't want to use an X and then mix it up with the letter X. And H is the unknown. That's the thing I'm looking for. What is the height? And so H is going to remain a letter. Are you cool with this, Marily? Does this yeah. make sense? Cool. Now, the basic principle that we learned last time when we did solving multi-step equations was uh, it's always a wise idea. Well, maybe not always, but it's usually a wise idea <laughs> to simplify before you solve. Do any forwards math before you start working backwards. And I see some forwards math that I know how to do. And you might say, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do fractions. No, but your calculator can still do this, okay? Um, so you can totally type that little bitty expression right there, 1 half times 15, into a calculator. We know how to multiply numbers, even if we hate fractions, okay? Now, I actually don't have to multiply it because I know that I can read that as 1 half of 15 and I can do one half of 15 in my head. Um, do you know how to do one half of 15 in your head, Marily? Not really. <laughs> then don't stress. You could use your calculator to do this too. There's a lot of ways to do it. Some students will say, hey, I know one half is the same as 0.5 and they'll type 0.5 into their calculator and times that by 15. Does oh, that make sense yeah. to you? Did you yeah. know one half was the same as 0.5? Nope. <laughs> Okay, well, let's try it another way. So I'm going to just, there's so many ways to do this. I could type that in my calculator. You can actually put fractions in your calculator using the N over D button. So I can type 1 and then N over D and then 2. And then I can go ahead and multiply that by 15. But I'll warn you, if you do that, Sometimes it gives you a fraction answer and sometimes it gives you a decimal answer. I just got a fraction out of my calculator because of the mode it was in. And so I'm going to have to turn it into a decimal by using the fraction to decimal button. And I'm just turning it into a decimal so it makes sense to me. That's the only reason. And I can see that half of 15 is 7.5. Are you okay with that? So, whoa, I just messed stuff up. Sorry. Okay, so 1 half times 15 is 7.5. Now I'm going to drop down whatever I haven't used up. So I haven't used my 34. It will drop. I haven't used my, of course, my equal stays steady, and I haven't touched my H. So that all drops. And now I always tell my students, don't look back. In fact, I'll make my students um, lay a piece of paper over the top of the screen right here so that all they're looking at is the new equation. And when I look at this, 34 is equal to 7.5H, well, that's just a one-step equation to solve. So if you don't know how to solve one-step equations, you need to go back to our um, intro to algebra class. But since that 7.5 is multiplying by H, I'll do the opposite. I'll divide by 7.5. I'm going to do it on both sides so my equation stays balanced. On the right-hand side, it'll cancel so that my H is alone. And on the left-hand side, there's the math to do. So I'm going to take 34, and I'm going to divide by 7.5. And when I do that, I get this ugly number out of my calculator with all these threes going on and on and on. Okay, and so you should know that for your final step, you should check your uh, problem for any rounding directions. So do I have any rounding directions in this problem? No. Ah, maybe. No, maybe. I don't know, right? So how can you tell if it's rounding directions? Look for that language where it says to the nearest, to the nearest tenth, to the nearest hundredth, okay. to the nearest foot. And I see that right there. To the, do you see it? To the nearest tenth? Yeah. Okay, so write this down if you don't know it. A tenth is the first decimal place. So if I'm telling you I round it rounded to the nearest tenth, I want my number to stop after the first decimal place. So I'm going to cut it off right there after that five, 4.5. That's one decimal place. But I do have to consider before I throw this part of the number away if it's big enough to matter. So I'm going to consider the first number that I'm throwing away, the three. And I'm going to ask myself if I was halfway there yet. Well, halfway through our digit system is the number five, right? Our digits go from zero to nine. So five is 
we just got over the halfway point. So since I'm not to five yet, I wasn't halfway, these digits are not big enough to matter. So less than five, we just ignore them. Greater than five, we would have had to round up our number. Okay, so I'm gonna just ignore them and I'm gonna call that about 4.5. So that height of my triangle is about 4.5 inches. Does that make sense, Marley? Yes. Okay, cool. Let's get a little trickier. Can I uh, go on to the next screen? Yes. And I told you I, I got lots of nasty examples today because <laughs> I want you to see just how gross the GED can be and get a chance to play around. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look. Sometimes they won't tell you what the shape is they'll expect you to know what they're talking about. So a merry-go-round consists of a spinning disc eleven feet in diameter. To the nearest foot How far would a child who is clinging to the railing <clears throat> and I'm writing out the problem myself so that you guys can write out the problem yourself. I know that um, we just watch YouTube videos and expect to be entertained, but I promise you if you write down these problems, you will remember this better instead of just listening to me okay so if they're the child is clinging to the railing around the outside how far are they going to travel in one revolution of the merry-go-round <clears throat> this is so ged typical They did not tell you the math words for what we're doing. They just gave you a real life scenario and they're expecting you to know uh, mathematically what's happening here. So first of all, I wanna start with a merry-go-round. Do we know what shape a merry-go-round is? I mean, they tell us it consists of a spinning disc. What does that mean? It's a round. Yeah, exactly. We got a circle going on here. And I'm just gonna look at my merry-go-round from the top, okay? And, I, and, and it's like a circle, so, um, and we say that this spinning disc is 11 feet in diameter. When you see that word diameter, uh, diameter is a line, an imaginary line that stretches from one end of a circle to the other right through the center. That's your diameter. So I'm saying from end to end, that's 11 feet, okay? Now, what are they asking me to find here? So there's what I've been given, but what are they asking me to find? How far would a child um, go around the outside? Travel? Around the outside. I like that phrasing, around the outside. So I'm imagining this little kid's clinging right here. He's standing on the edge, and he's spinning around the outside of this circle. Is that what you imagined as well, Marley? Yeah. Okay, so this is super important. You need to know that the distance around the outside of a circle is called its circumference. If you don't know that, you'll be in trouble. That's the distance around the outside of a circle. And it kind of makes sense to me because circum means to go around. Mm -hmm. Like we talk about explorers circumnavigating the globe. And fence kind of sounds like fence to me. So I always think of it as the fence around, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's, but it's the distance around the outside of a circle. Okay, so cool. Now we know what we're looking for. We're looking for the circumference of this circle. So take a look at your GED formula sheet. You might say, Kate, there's nothing here that says circumference. But because circumference is around the outside of a shape, you're actually going to find it in the perimeter section. So go ahead and take a look at the section where we have the perimeter formulas. They're right under the area mm -hmm. formulas. And you're going to see the circumference of a circle formula. And do you notice this? They give you two formulas. It says C equals two pi R or B equals pi D. 
And then there's a semicolon after that and more information, but those are the two formulas, okay? And students ask me like, well, why are there two? Uh, notice one of them has an R in it, one of them has a D in it. There's two because sometimes we know one thing about a circle, sometimes we know another thing about a circle. So let's take a look at what we know about our circle. What do we know? We know the diameter. So you know which formula we want to use? The one with the D in it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make our lives easy and use the one with the letter of the thing we have if we have a choice. Does that make sense? Mm. Okay, so let's plug into that what we know. Okay, so what are we looking for? We said we were looking for the circumference. So circumference is going to be our mystery, so it's going to remain a letter. Now you might be thinking, well, what the heck is this little pi thing? Kate called this little symbol pi. This is actually a number. Pi is actually a number, um, but it's an irrational number, meaning its decimal form goes on and on forever. 3.14159. And I, I don't like to, um, as a mathematician, I want an exact number. I don't want a decimal that goes on forever, so I just call it pi. But since this is a word problem, you can use the approximation for pi. 3.14 isn't exactly pi, but it's close enough for our word problem since we're going to round anyway. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. And if you forget pi, notice that that was right there. That was the end of the circumference formula. It actually tells you that pi is approximately 3.14. Okay. And now, do we know our D, our diameter of our circle? 11. 11. Beautiful. Now take a look. This problem is actually a lot easier than the last one because you can see my letters already alone. So I don't need any algebra skills, just arithmetic. I just have to be able to do this math over here, this simplifying. So 3.14 times 11 gives me 34.54. Now don't be the foolish student who just assumes that they did good and stops there. Make sure you check for any rounding directions. So did you see any rounding directions in this problem, Miss Murley? It's not five. It's not in the middle of a rounding number. Say that again. It's not in the middle. It's not in the middle? Of a rounding number. Um, you have to go and look and see what they told you to round okay. to. They could tell you to keep it just like this. They could tell you to round in the middle. They could do all kinds of things. So it's important to look for the language in the problem. Does that oh, make sense? Okay. okay. Yeah. And so here in this particular problem, I see, do you see the phrase to the nearest? Okay, yeah. That's my clue that it's rounding language. And what do they say they want it? To the nearest? Foot. Foot. See how this is just a plain old foot? They don't say 10th or 100th. or They don't give me any place value. They just say foot. This is a unit. When they ask you to round to the nearest unit, like a foot or an inch, you're just going to cut it off right at that decimal place. So you're kind of right, at the middle. <laughs> <laughs> See, but remember, anytime you go to throw out a number, you have to consider, is that number big enough to matter? So this is the first number I'm throwing away. Is it five or higher? Yes, it mm -hmm. is. So we were halfway to the next number. We were at 34 and something, but we were closer to the the next mm -hmm. number past 34. And so I'm going to round that up to 35. So I kind of joke around and I say that the, this fives, oh, sorry. I didn't agree with myself. I say that this five's final act is going to be to bump its buddy up before mm -hmm. it dies. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 35, what? It would be about 35 feet. This uh, kid is whipping around in a circle. Okay, Woo, that was tricky. How are you feeling? Mm, more lighted. lighted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, ready? Let's do another one. Here we go. Can I erase this one? Yes. Okay. Let's bust out another circle, but let's make our lives a little trickier. The area of a circle is about 55 and again, I read that as square centimeters. That's just the mathematician in me being too lazy to spell the word square, okay? And then they ask me, what is the radius of the circle to the nearest tenth of a centimeter? Oh, 
Okay, Ms. Murley, what are they asking me to find this time? The radius of the circle. Brilliant. And where am I starting from? What do I know? The, it's 55 centimeters. Mm -hmm. What is that thing? That 55 centimeters is the what? The area. Absolutely. So I'm starting with the area and I have to find the radius. Okay, let's go find an appropriate formula. So when I look at my formula sheet, I can see that that first section is area formulas. Okay, so we are finding the area of a circle. So I will bust out the area of a circle formula, which says A is equal to, and look, there's that little pi again, R squared. Do you see that formula? Yes, I see it. Cool. Now we'll plug in what we know. So you told me that this 55 was the? Area. Area. So I'm going to write 55 under the letter A. Now, my equals will stay equals. Pi is an actual number, and like I said, since I have this word problem where I'm going to end up rounding anyway, I can just go ahead and call pi 3.14. Um, let me do that actually in a different color so my students who struggle to see algebra can see the substitution happening. Okay, and um, radius is the mystery. That's what we've been asked to find. What is the radius? So radius will stay R. And of course, I won't drop any symbols. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay, cool. Now, a lot of students aren't sure, do I simplify or do I solve? Um, some students will ask me, well, shouldn't I square this 3.14? Because they see this 3.14 and they see this square and they want to square it. Be really careful. Exponents are super weak. This exponent is only working on the thing it's directly attached to. It's only squaring the R. It doesn't reach that far over. Exponents only work on the base that they're attached to. And so don't square that 3.14. That would be unwise, okay? Oh. So that means we're not going to be able to do any simplifying. So what should we do if we can't simplify? We are going to start our solving process, okay? We're going to work to get the letter alone. Now, I have two things to get rid of in order to get this variable alone. We talked about this a little bit when we did solving two-step equations. We said if you have two things to get rid of, you need to make sure, or two or more things, it really doesn't matter, but you need to make sure that you're working your order of operations, Gemma, backwards. So first we'll move anything that's adding or subtracting. Well, this 3.14 is shoved up against this R. It's not adding, it's multiplying. So there's no addition to do, but I can get rid now of this multiplication. And so what I'm going to do is divide by 3.14. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. I'm working Gemma backwards. So the rule of uh, equations is that I can do whatever I want as long as I do it to both sides. So I divide both sides by 3.14. On this side it cancels so that the only thing I have left is my R squared. On this side 55 divided by 3.14 is the math to do. Now I have to tell you I already know that this is not going to go well, that I'm going to get a long ugly number and I want to caution you even if you don't write the whole long ugly number down Please don't erase it in your calculator. Just keep that number in your calculator because you don't want to round till the end because you'll lose information. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I have that number still in my calculator. I didn't clear it. And now R is almost alone. I just have to get rid of a square, a square, that little floating two. Um, so we learned that the opposite of add is subtract. The opposite of multiply is divide but the opposite of square is square root. So if you want to get rid of a square, you are going to have to square root the entire side of the equation. Now, I have taught you that you can do whatever you want in algebra class as long as you do it to both sides. So don't settle with just writing that square root on one side. Jump across the equal sign and square root the expression on the left-hand side as well. Are we cool with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's see what happens. On the right-hand side, of course, my square and my square root will cancel, leaving R alone, which is just what I wanted. And on the right-hand side, I want to do this in my calculator. This is really nice to do in a TI-30 excess calculator, the one you get on the GED, because you can actually, you don't have to type in this whole number. You can pick up the answer. Here's how we're going to do it. We want the square root button. 
the square root button is written in green above x squared. So anytime you want something in green, you have to press second first. So press second and then square root. And now I want to get the answer in there. Notice that ANS, that stands for answer, is written right above the minus sign on the bottom. Again, that, that ANS is written in green, so you're going to have to hit second first. So I'm going to hit second and then ANS to get the answer. And what you should see on your calculator right now, it should look like this, square root of ANS. If it doesn't look like that, you did it wrong. And I press enter, and it tells me it's 4.1852, da, 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 da. Okay, now, um, now I'll follow any rounding directions. Do you see any rounding directions in the problem? No. Are you looking for that phrase to the nearest? Yes. Look for it for me. Look for it. It's there. The two? Oh, I mean the four. I'm sorry, the four. I see. Do you see the two the nearest? Do you see that? Oh, I'm already looking on the number, sorry, the to the nearest tenth of a cent. Tenth. Yeah, you got to look back to the problem for the rounding directions before you decide to, how to round, okay? Mm -hmm. So the problem says take it to the nearest tenth, we'll take it to the nearest tenth. Okay. So what did we say the nearest tenth meant? That meant we're going to leave around one decimal place. So don't chop it at the four, chop it after the one. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now consider the number you're about to lose. It's an eight. Is eight halfway there yet? Is it big enough to matter? Yes. It sure is. And so its last act before it dies is going to be to bump its buddy up. That's not really a one. It's really closer to a two. So we're going to call that radius about 4.2 centimeters. Tricky. A lot of skills going on here. How are you mm -hmm. feeling? Good. Okay. Good. <laughs> you came for a hard lesson, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I want to go back to intro to algebra. <laughs> okay. Let's try another one. Okay, so this one has a gross formula, so I wanted to make sure I got a chance to do it with you guys so you don't um, just freak out the first time you see this formula. So a trapezoid has an area of 51 square inches. And look, I am spelling it out this time instead of writing IN2. <laughs> the one base measures, I'm going to erase that because my words are all cramped together like they're two, the same word, but they weren't. <laughs> the one base measures 12 inches and the other 22 inches. What is the height of the trapezoid? So again, some students don't know what a trapezoid is, so I'll start with drawing a picture. A trapezoid is a four-sided shape. It's a quadrilateral. But the way a trapezoid works is two of the shapes will be um, parallel. They'll run in the same direction, but the other two uh, don't necessarily have to be parallel. So they can run in any direction. So that's a little confusing for students. But we got one set of parallel sides, okay? Now, if you're doing a trapezoid, when you talk about the bases, those are the two parallel sides. So we have one base that's 12 inches and another one that's 22 inches. And they're asking us to find the height. The height runs perpendicular from one base to the other base. And perpendicular just means at a perfect right angle, okay? The walls in your house are hopefully perpendicular or you're probably suing the guy who built your house, okay? Nice straight up and down. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I uh, claim that there's a formula on this sheet that's going to help us out, okay? Um, so uh, yes, what have we been asked to find, Miss Murley? Let's start there. The height of the trapezoid? Exactly. We've been asked to find the height of the trapezoid. And where are we starting? What do we know about the trapezoid? The area of 50 has an area of 51 square inches. Mm-hmm. And then it looks like we also know the base measurements. 
Okay, awesome. So I'm going to start with the area of a trapezoid formula. And this one looks disgusting. If you look at your formula sheet, you're going to be like, really? Because <laughs> the area of a trapezoid formula says A equals one half H times the quantity. When I open a parenthesis, I say times the quantity of B1 plus B2. I really wanted to get a chance to do this kind of formula with you guys because um, this is one that intimidates a lot of students because they look at this B1 and B2 and they're like, I don't know what that means. B1 and B2, that's math I don't even know how to do. My teacher never taught me that. Um, those little um, numbers that are down on, on the bottom, that's not math to do. That's known as a subscript. Mathematicians use subscript and formulas to talk about the ordinal numbers. The ordinal numbers give us order. That's like when you're, I say, what place are you in line? You don't say, I'm in one place. Instead, you say, I'm in first place, second place, so on and so forth. So when I say B1, I'm saying the first base. And when I say B2, I'm saying second base. And there's no third and fourth base because we don't have fun in math class. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad joke, Marley. Okay, so let's plug in what we know into this formula, okay? So you told me that we know the area. And so under A, I'm going to write 51. But I do not change my equal sign or my numbers. Do I know the height? The height, no. No, that's the thing I'm finding. So that will remain a letter. It'll stay H. I'll keep my parentheses. Now, base one and base two. Uh, people might say like, which one's base one and which one's base two? And it actually doesn't matter even one little bit. So you could call it 12 and 22 or 22 and 12. I'll get to the same place in the end, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I've plugged in all my numbers. Are you cool with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, again, we'll follow that basic math principle of simplify before we solve. Do any forwards math that you know how to do before you start working backwards. And I sure do know how to add 12 and 22, so let's start with that. So I'll keep my 51, my half, my H, and 12 plus 22 is 34. Are we cool with that? Mm -hmm. Now, there's one more active simplification we can do. Some students will miss it and not do it. And actually, it, it, it still might turn out okay in the end because um, as long as you do something true, it'll be good. But what I want you to realize is that 1 half and H and 34 are just three numbers multiplying. Certainly, one of those numbers we don't know, H is a mystery, but it's still just three numbers multiplying. And I know the um, associative property tells me, so does the commutative property. I can move them around. I can group them any way I want. I, when I multiply, I'm going to get the same answer. And so I can multiply these two together right now. If you can do it in your head, half of 34, more power to you. If you can't, again, we have tons of options with our calculator. I think I'll be the lazy girl who just says 0.5 times 34 because I know one half is the same as 0.5. And so I got 17. Really careful though, I haven't dealt with my H yet, so it's still there, it drops, and my 51 and my equals drops. Are you cool with that? Mm -hmm. Now, the simplifying that I could do is done. It's time to start solving, time to try to get this letter alone. So 17 and H are multiplying, so I'll break them up using division. Uh, I made a change, so I'm going to do it to both sides so that my equation stays balanced. And on this side, 17 and 17 cancel, leaving me with H. And 51 divided by 17 better be 3. It is three, yay. So what is the height of my trapezoid? It is three inches. And I didn't even look for rounding directions because I'm guessing it doesn't round. But yeah, you're not gonna see to the nearest in this problem at all. Are you cool with that? Yes. Wonderful. Oh, I wanted to do this one. Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, let's say Jack's Cracker Snacks wants to make a new package
for its popcorn snack. Okay. Um, the package will be shaped like a rectangular prism. And needs to have a volume of, and here's why this problem is just so scary for students, 108 and 3 quarter cubic inches. If the width of the box needs to be seven and a quarter inches and the depth one and a quarter inches how tall will the box be a little gross okay we got a lot going on Okay, um, so I would ask you, Miss Murley, what is the question they're asking me for? What are they trying to get me to find? They want to make a new package um, that is shaped like a rectangle. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And what do they want me to tell them about that package? Uh, hint, it's down there with the question mark. It, oh, it has to be seven and fourth quarters I'm yeah, sorry. that's what they're giving me but where are they asking me to go so take a look look at this question language do you see this language how tall, tall will the box need to be they're asking me to find out how tall the box is does that make sense mm -hmm. okay cool let's um try to draw our box so when they say rectangular prism that's just basically the kind of cereal box you think of. All a rectangular prism is, is like a rectangle box. Okay, so we're used to rectangular prisms. They happen all the time, okay? okay. Now, we know some information about this box. We know that it is seven and a quarter inches wide. And we know that it is one, oh, was that seven and a quarter? That was seven and a quarter, and I wrote seven and a half. Mm -hmm. We're in trouble. I'm screwing up. Okay, so we know that it's seven and a quarter inches uh, wide and one and a quarter inches deep. So seven and a quarter inches wide and one and a quarter inches deep. Is that cool with you? Mm -hmm. Does yes. that make sense? Yes. Okay, now this is what I'm looking for, this height, but I have one more piece of information. I also know this thing's volume. The volume needs to be 108 and three quarter inches. And so I am going to bust out my volume formulas. When you go to take a look at your surface area and volume formulas, which is about um, a third to halfway down the page, you're going to see that the very first one is a rectangular prism. Okay, now be careful. There's two formulas. The first one, SA, that's surface area. So I'm going to need the one that starts with a V if I want to find the volume. So volume equals length, times width times height. Now, let's plug in what we know here. We know the volume is 108 and 3 quarters. I do not want to do math with fractions, especially in my calculator if I can help it, because I'm too lazy, especially mixed numbers. They just don't go well. Um, and so I am so lazy that I am going to do the shortcut. I happen to know that one way to read three-fourths is three-quarters. Do you know that, Marilee? You could read that as three-quarters? No. Yeah. A fourth is also called a quarter. Okay, like a quarter of an orange is a fourth of an orange. I'm breaking an orange into four pieces if I take a quarter. Okay, or a quarter of an hour is breaking an hour into four pieces. Or we have a quarter we're used to, a quarter of a dollar, right? We carry quarters around in our pocket because that's like four of those make up a dollar. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Marilee, if you had three quarters in your hand, I bet you would know how much money you had. 
Three quarters is how much money? 75 cents. Absolutely. So you know what? I don't have to write three quarters. I can write 0.75. And look at that. You were able to convert a fraction without even thinking about it because we use that one all the time in real life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's equal to. Now, it's interesting because they told me what my width is, my W, um, but the other measurement they give me is they say depth. And I don't see a D here for depth. It's like students go, what do I do? No, that a rectangular solid just only has these three measurements. Whether I call it depth or I call it length, I, I'm having the same conversation, okay? So we're just going to say that my length and my width are seven and a quarter. How much is a quarter worth if I have one quarter? Like one 25. quarter in your pocket. What? 25. 25. So I can write seven and a quarter as 7.25. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, okay, so 7.25, and the depth is one and a quarter, so like 1.25, like a dollar and a quarter, okay? Now, it says, how tall will the box need to be? Again, I don't have a T for tall, but I happen to know that H stands for height, and height and tallness, that's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for my H, okay? So that one can throw us because of the letters. Uh, now, let's go ahead and simplify, so 7.25 times 1.25 gives me 9.0625. And notice I'm being obedient. I'm just simplifying. I'm doing what they told me to do. But now that I've run out of simplifying to do, now's the time to start solving. I'm going to do the exact opposite. Instead of multiplying, I'm going to divide. And because I'm making a change, I'm going to do it to both sides. So on this side, those two numbers will cancel, leaving me with H, and there's the gross math to do. 1.08, or 108, sorry, 0.75, and I'm gonna divide by the answer, because I'm too lazy to type it in again. And look, it turns out really nice, 12. So 12 what? Uh, looks like we were working in inches. How tall does the box need to be? It needs to be 12 inches high. Woo, that was nasty. <laughs> Is that cool? Yeah. Okay, the next problem I have is probably the ugliest one of this kind that you might see on the GED. Okay, so let's see how we do. Okay, so I still have the Snack Jacks company. But they're trying to package super sweet sugar snacks. I'm too lazy to write super sweet sugar snacks. Can I call them super sweet sugar snacks? S-S-S-S. <laughs> it's long. <laughs> right? <laughs> I think everybody's already turned off the video too. They're like, are you really writing out every problem? Yes, I am. Y'all can handle. <laughs> Y'all have a forward button. Okay, so Snack Jacks wants to package uh, super sweet sugar snacks in a cylindrical package. Each package should hold two hundred and forty cubic inches of snack. If the company decides to go with a cylinder with a radius of three inches, how tall will the package be? And we'll do it to the nearest tenth of an inch. So once again, let's take a look at where we're going. Well, they asked us how tall uh, will the package be? And so obviously, how tall? I'm trying to find the height. How tall, height, same difference. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, now where am I starting? What information did they give me, Miss Morelli? 
That's oh, that's actually harder than it looks here. I bet you see the number. Give me a, the the first number you see here. Two hundred and forty. Yeah, they say I have 240 cubic inches, but they actually don't tell me what that number is. They just say each package should hold 240 cubic inches. So I have a couple of clues that this is volume. One of my clues that it's volume is that this is a three-dimensional measurement. Uh, see how it says inches cubed with that little floating three? The only... Um, measurement that I know of that's three-dimensional is volume. Volume goes, you know, it's not a flat measurement. It looks at how much something holds. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then that's my other clue, this word hold. So volume is like how much soda could go in your glass or how much sand could go inside your sandbox. It's like how much can it hold? Um, one thing in your house that always gets measured in cubic inches or cubic feet is the space inside your refrigerator because that's how much your refrigerator could hold. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, cool. So um, this is a measure of volume, whether they told me that or not. And then I also know the radius. So it looks like we're getting a cylindrical package. So a cylindrical package looks like um, a shape where I got a circle on either end and then it goes up, the uh, rest of the package goes up straight from either circle, okay? And then I know that my radius, so radiuses go from the center of a circle to the outside is three inches. Are you cool with that? Mm -hmm. So I'll bust out my volume of a cylinder formula and it should say, what does it say? Volume of a cylinder, oh, I totally knew that. Pi r squared h, okay? Now we'll plug in what we know. So we know 240, what did we say 240 was? The inches. It, it's cubic inches, but that's the volume. Remember, if it was cubic inches, it's a three-dimensional measurement, and our only three-dimensional measurement is wow. volume. So I'll write that 240 under V. And then there's pi again. Look at that. Anytime you see pi, especially if there's rounding directions, you can go ahead and plug in 3.14. Now, uh, radius, oh, oh, I know the radius. My radius is three inches. So I'm going to plug in that three and square it. Notice how I do it with parentheses. Mm-hmm. And H is the thing I'm looking for. Okay, great. Now the great news is anytime you have um, simplifying to do, you can just go ahead and plug the entire expression, if there's no letter in it, into your calculator. And so I'm going to take this entire thing right here and plug it in my calculator, 3.14. And I'm going to open up a parentheses, 3, close that parentheses. And then I'm going to square it using that X squared button. So I type 3.14. 3, and then I typed x squared to square it. Great. And when I type that in, I get 28.26. So I got my 240 is equal to 28.26. And what's left over here? Just an h. And this is a simple little one-step equation to solve now. So I'll divide by 28.26. And I'm going to get h equal to some ugly stuff. 240 divided by my old answer, 8.49256. Looks like we need some rounding directions. Uh, what did the problem say about rounding, Ms. Marilli? It says to the nearest length of an inch. To the nearest tenth, sorry. That's I'm sorry, crappy sorry. handwriting. <laughs> to the nearest tenth of an inch. So remember, a tenth is one decimal place. So we're going to cut it off after our one decimal place. But we're going to consider that number we just cut off. Is, it, is that nine big enough to matter? Yes. Sure is. So we'll call that about 8.5 inches. Are you cool with that? Yes. Woo! Was that fierce? A little. I, yeah. I got it. I have like six more I wanted to do, but I wonder if I should save it for another class because it's already 5.30. So I've been talking a long time. So I think I will. I'll uh, make a follow-up to this video if anybody still wants to put up with me and work six more problems that might show up on the GED. But I'm going to end this class for now. Um, so Miss. Merle, thank you for showing up, and um, I will post when I post this with a worksheet if you wanted to try these types of problems, okay? Yes, thank All you. All right.
Nice talking to you. Bye. Bye.